Good afternoon and welcome to the uh, May 22nd um, date of our East Bay Regional Park District Legislative Committee meeting. Um, I'm looking for attendees and, and uh, let me start off by saying um, I think everyone's here is Elizabeth. Here comes Elizabeth. Great, we'll take roll in just a moment, but I'd like to start a preamble. Uh, today's board meeting is held in accordance with the Governor Newsom's executive order allowing for board members to participate in standing committee meetings remotely, and that's what we plan on doing. We're live streaming today and provided members of the public the opportunity to email or call in prior to the meeting for public comment. We welcome your public comments, uh, and the public comments will be taken at the end of the meeting. Uh, this information can be found on the agenda for at the district website at ebparks.org. Uh, do any committee members or any members of the public or that can speak in this issue have any questions about the meeting procedures? If not, hearing none, I think we're getting used to this process. So once again, welcome to the legislative committee meeting. Our meeting will start um, um, I think I probably should mention, um, Yuli, do you, do you take a role at these? Yes, I do. Okay, let's do that. All right. So we have Chair Dennis Waspy. Here. Board Member Beverly Lane. Here. Board Member Elizabeth Eccles. <coughs> Here. General Manager Robert Doyle. Here. Chief of Government and Legislative Affairs, Eric Feeler. Here. Legislative and Policy Management Analyst, Lisa Baldinger. Here. Uh, legislative Advocates, State, Doug Houston. Present. No, you know that. Advocate Federal, Peter Umhofer. Here. And now for, uh, I will just list the names of staff that are listening in here. So we have Rachel Sater, Jim Tallarico, Jeff Rasmussen, Katie Hornbeck, and we also have uh, tech, tech support from Prime Gov today. Thank you, Chair Waspy. All right, thank you. So to begin with, we're gonna start with state legislation. And I think everyone's aware that's um, connected. We're going to handle the state legislation. We have four bills that are recommended for support to be sent to the full board for support. And what we're gonna do is hear a report on each of these pieces of legislation. But unlike in the past, where we would vote on each one, we're gonna handle this as a sort of consent item. Uh, and at the end of the four presentations, we will vote on the whole, unless there's uh, some concern or we can pull it just like a consent item and, and vote individually if we want. But the plan is to vote on all four of these bills to recommend to the full board for support. So we'll start with state legislation, Doug or Eric. Sure. Oh, sure. Eric, you want me to kick things off? Sure. Yeah, very good. On um, the first piece of legislation by Assembly Member Rudy Solis, the Bakersfield, pretty self-explanatory. This member is looking to reclassify public safety dispatchers, um, elevate their classification. Um, the, your summary goes into some detail, which underscores the, the importance of these workers and this profession in responding to emergency situations. And your staff notes that to the extent that um, you do have dispatchers that there would be impacts um, to the district if this bill were to advance. And I don't know if you have a recommended position or I guess it's a consent item. So we'll take all at the end of the, the presentation. Any questions, comments? Just wanted to add that the legislation came 
uh, to our attention by our public safety division um, and by the G uh, AGM for public safety. So it, it has their support. Any other questions, comments from board members? I, I hear none. I have a question. So um, we, um, the reference was, or, or it's been said it would elevate their classification. Does that, uh, is there, are there, I, I assume there are costs um, involved with that. Um, and do, has anybody evaluated that? Um, uh, I, I would assume there is too, and I don't actually know the specifics on that. So we could, if, if the board prefers, we could hold off on it until we know that number and that statistic. Um, this is Rachel Sater, Assistant District Counsel. I, um, Director Waspy, Chair Waspy, I had the same question and uh, looked into this a little bit. This appears to be principally a symbolic um, move, acknowledging the importance of our dispatchers in our emergency response. There is um, actually expressly um, in the bill a statement that it will not change their um, entitlements specifically. So at least my understanding is that we don't anticipate any um, impact to the district. All right, thank you. I, and as I fully support uh, all of our dispatchers and have worked with them as a firefighter for 31 years, they, they do excellent work. And yes, they are essential, vital um, uh, public servants and, and, and great, they are first responder, for responders. I agree with that. But I'm, I was wondering, my specifically, I was wondering, uh, would they be considered would they go from miscellaneous employees to safety employees, get to retire at 50 um, at the 3%? Uh, but I guess we'll, this will, the, nothing would change that way, I, I guess you're saying. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, General Manager Doyle, please uh, unmute your mic. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to uh, echo what the, the chair has said um, think about our dispatchers during this time in a room, uh, long, long periods of time trying to direct traffic with all the things going on in extremely busy parks. And uh, so I, I, I think the recognition is well deserved and we'll continue to monitor this if there happens to be any amendments or changes. All right, if there are no further questions, let's move to uh, AB 3030. Very good, Chairman. Um, so this this bill reads very much like a, a resolution, in my opinion. It's, um, it's if, it, if nothing else, it's very aspirational. Talks about the goals of trying to achieve conservation of 30% of the land in California, as well as uh, ocean property, or I guess ocean. I don't space. I'm not. I'm not quite sure uh, how to describe that in water. But um, uh, I guess there's there's some confusion on my behalf, and I think Beverly had had an exchange with Eric about some of the definitions. But you know, based on some just a little bit of research that I did. There is a there's a database, uh, California Protected Area database out there that suggests that 47% uh, of the land in California is currently protected. And that doesn't include easements, privately held easements. So um, the notion of conserving 30%, uh, I guess it's just there's a there's there's some definitions and I don't know Eric if you've looked into it a little bit uh, closer, but uh, evidently this comes out of a, a report issued by the Center for American Progress and it's it's getting some traction nationwide. And um, this this author's out of San Jose just um, took the opportunity to he sees the opportunity to. Uh, try to institutionalize the report to some degree and, and move it through the legislative process. So, yeah, I just I would just add that the um, Beverly's question actually uh, led me to 
go online and find out that there's a lot of information about this concept. Um, and I, I have myself in reviewing um, have seen different numbers for percentages. So I think it depends upon what year they were doing the calculation. But in general, I believe the land is primarily state, local, and federal land that is protected, such as state parks or our parks. And then there is a definition that talks about private conservation and tribal initiatives and innovative preservation approaches. Um, so there's a, a wide range of what they are considering protected for the purposes of this bill. Um, there's not, and correct me if I'm wrong, Doug, but there's not a lot of uh, teeth to the bill yet. It, it is, I think, pr primarily a statement of intent, but there's not really um, a lot, a mechanism to enforce it or to, to move it forward. Yes, correct. So I, I, I think we could, we could take some time and try to really figure out what the actual percentage is, but I think just in terms of the concept of protecting our land and water, um, you know, at least 30% of the state, I think it's a, a, a good aspirational goal to have. And, and if we've already met it, then, then great, but we can continue to, to look into it and um, try to make sure we understand what it means if it moves uh, beyond uh, a statement. Yeah. All right, thank you. Any questions or comments from board members on this piece of legislation? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much. It looks aspirationally wonderful. <laughs> I think so too. Bob, did you have something? Yeah, I, sorry, I'm turning myself off. So you, uh, there's no, there's some noise outside my house. Um, I just, um, it, I think everyone knows E.O. Wilson, the famous uh, biologist uh, of international recognition. He has a, a, a huge effort going on. It's called the half earth effort and it's to preserve half of the earth um as some type of conservation lands and it just gives a little context to this this is a little more conservative um, and just remember how much federal property if you think of the desert lands blm lands how much federal property there is in uh, california so i'm not sure like eric said i'm not sure how they're making the count um but it sounds like a lot um but uh I know the goal of the E.O. Wilson effort in that, that major international conservation effort is for preservation of habitat. It does not have to be federal or state ownership. It could be private, but protected ownership. And I think, uh, I think that's where this basically came from. And then that was uh, tiered off into what Doug said was this effort. Um, but that's a big effort going on uh, and it's, uh, worth looking into. Um, obviously, E.O. Wilson is a great writer and a, a great leader on conservation. I can just add from the federal side, there has been this collaborative effort with the National Geographic Society and some large organizations and that's branched out into multiple state efforts <laughs> as well to meet this goal. And it, um, there are a dozen websites if you Google this goal and it all kind of filters back to a, like you mentioned, Robert, a set of scientists that issued this declaration and plea and then it became this initiative of 30 by 30. Um, it's now gone international, national and trying to lay these seeds at the state and local level as well. All right, if there's nothing further on that bill, let's move to AB 3256 by Eduardo Garcia. Very good, yeah. So we, we've had conversations about the prospects of a, a climate bond. And last year there were a couple of vehicles, actually three vehicles that were um, trying to look toward the finish line late in the, the, the legislative year last year, and they, um, they just never got a green light from the administration. Um, the budget was released earlier this year, obviously in January. Um, the governor included a, a climate bond, resiliency bond of $4.8 billion. So taking the governor's lead, uh, Mr. Garcia, who's, who's been involved on, um, it's been on the front line when it comes to bonds, obviously, Prop 68. Uh, 
has been instructed by the speaker and leadership to um, lead a, a cadre of his folks um, through the process and trying to advance a, a climate resiliency bond. Now, more recently, just based on COVID and uh, what's, what's transpired relative to the economy, um, they're taking a, a closer look at 3256 and they may be pivoting um, in terms of content. They have already pivoted on the, the title itself to include the words uh, economic recovery that was just amended into the bill uh, earlier this week. And so um, if this bill does continue to, to advance, um, based on my intelligence, it will need to thematically be less about climate and be a little bit more about economic recovery. Now, how they how they restructure it, how they repackage it or repurpose it uh, is yet to be determined. But the bill was uh, voted out of uh, Assembly and Natural Resources Committee last week on a seven to one vote and um, scheduled to be in an assembly appropriations in, um, in a week and a half. We don't, um, as we'll, we'll get into detail on the, on the May revise, the governor has struck um, his endorsement of a, a climate bond from his particular budget, but there hasn't been a clear signal from the administration to halt all um, it halt the advancement of the bond quite yet. So taking that cue, Mr. Garcia has continued to push forward, working hard to advocate within his particular caucus, and, and he's teamed up with a couple of senators to try to move something forward. Uh, me, I'm working in collaboration with a lot of folks, um, have done a poll. We're on the brink of launching a second, more comprehensive poll that we hope will help to inform the legislature about um, what voter sentiment is regarding not just a climate bond, but bonds in general. And to dig, to dive in a little deeper, the polling is going to, the approach is going to be twofold. Well, it's going to be asked of the voters to um, is it their preference if they if they think a a debt instrument is an important thing in this climate to move forward with? Should it be a mega bond uh, and wrap in a whole lot of subject matters, or should it be similar to if you recall back in two thousand six we had a, a series of bonds, uh, propositions one A through one E, and would that be a preferred approach moving forward? If in fact the legislature gets a green light from the administration uh, to do that. So um, that's kind of where we're at right now. Your summary uh, uh, describes the, the various buckets currently contained within the bond. We've identified um, a lot of opportunities for the district um, thus far, and, and we're hoping if the bill continues to, to move along and get further amended that there will be more opportunity. So that I'll stop and I'll take questions or if Eric or Robert, you guys have anything to share? Doug, is it is it your understanding um, that this bill would be, if, if the legislature were to advance something that, that uh, Assemblymember Garcia and a version of this bill would be the likely vehicle? That's what I've been told. Um, uh, the the assembly speaker is very emphatic that uh, he he feels as though Eduardo did um, the bulk of the work on Proposition sixty eight, but his name wasn't associated with it as much as the pro tem at the time. And this go around, if there is to be a bond, that um, it will be Eduardo that will be authoring the bond, and it will come at, it will come out of the assembly. But there it'll be negotiated, obviously. So I think for the purposes of advocacy, uh, for, for your purposes, Doug, and, and also for, for us uh, at the local level uh, talking to members, this would be a good, this would be the bill to point to uh, and put some energy behind, even though we know it's going to evolve and, and 
possibly be something a little bit different in terms of the jobs uh, creation package. Uh, but just for the purposes of advocacy, this is probably one that we would like to have a support position on so that we can have something to point to when we're talking to our delegation. Yeah, that'd be my recommendation because um, there, there is that Senate vehicle SB 45, but I, I'm not certain that the assembly, they haven't scheduled that bill for hearing. And, um, you know, we, we're running under very compressed time frames right now. And so I, I don't even know if it's going to get a hearing at the end of the day. So, yeah, I think all of our energies and our focus around advocacy should really, um, confluence should all go through 3256. And, and the only other thing that I would just add briefly is, and, and I know Lisa's on the board of, of uh, Together Bay Area, but that uh, the policy committee of that organization, which used to be the Bay Area Open Space Council, I believe they are zeroing in on this uh, bond proposal and with the specific ask of 200 million for uh, this uh, Bay program of the Coastal Conservancy and 800 million overall for the Coastal Conservancy. So that seems to be where the regional focus is at the, at the moment. And I, I just, um, uh, Chairman Waspy, I don't know if we have a category be, uh, above support, uh, but I'd like to have one. <laughs> uh, this is critically important. Um, as everyone's very well aware, there's never been more demand in use of parks in the history of the state and um, anything we can do to get some help. I, I want us not to forget um, that while bonds can't pay for staffing, they can pay for programs, they can pay for um, concessionaires uh, by growing those businesses in parks um, through park systems. And there's a lot of people who um, are small businesses that work in parks up and down the state, that their livelihood comes from parks. And most of those are closed now. Um, in some areas like us starting to open, but um, I think as far as the stimulus beyond the actual park use and the importance of improving and providing access in parks, I think there's a lot of bit small businesses that work in park systems that are really mom and pop businesses that uh, could use improvements in their facilities as well and, and to grow their businesses by having more, more use in the parks that we can accommodate through improvement. So I think it's critical and I think we can pivot towards jobs, small business and uh, fighting this terrible recession that's coming at us. All right, any questions or comments from board members? Um, whoops, I lost my screen, but I'm, I'm hearing none. But Robert, I, I agree with you. If there's maybe there's nothing uh, bigger than uh, support, maybe strongly support, but obviously with our, our uh, efforts in Prop 68, we were way past strongly support. And I think your advocacy and the Doug's and, and, and the legislative uh, branch of our, our park district, uh, that that's, would be our strongly support. And I, I would be behind that. So. Hopefully this will make it and hopefully it'll be the right time. Great. So if I might just, just chime in as well, um, I, I agree, strongly support. And uh, Bob, I, I really appreciate and agree with your comments about the, the economic impacts and the potential uh, both retaining jobs and job creation for small businesses that, that work in parks and other work that might need to be done in the parks as well beyond the small businesses that, that exist there. So I think those are really important points that we should keep in mind as we lobby and, and push for this bill. And Eric, I don't know if you want to use your number you use for Bay Point, and I know you're collecting those other numbers, but it's quite surprising when we do a park capital project, how many jobs come out of that? I, I am, even after all these years, I'm really surprised. So Eric, maybe a comment on that. Yeah, the the, the Bay Point project, um, we were able to gather information from staff about how many other contractors worked on it. Um, and we've come up with a number of 200 additional people beyond park district employees that had a role in moving that project forward. Um, and Lisa and I have been working with um, our finance department to try to find a, um, a metrics for future projects. So the reason we could calculate Bay Point is we'd, 
basically it's completed. Uh, but now in thinking about like McCosker or uh, Dumbarton Quarry or, um, you know, Brickyard at, at, at Eshore, um, we're trying to think about a way to quantify proactively how many jobs those um, restoration and improvement projects would, would create. And I think we're getting pretty close to um, aligning something up and we'll be able to start to share those numbers. In, in addition, uh, the Together Bay Area uh, group has also done a look at that regionally. And I think some other agencies have, have come up with some numbers that um, should look pretty impressive. And I think those have been translated to, to Doug and some of the folks up in Sacramento for the purposes of advocate, advocacy for this bond. Yeah, if you think of uh, um, Albany Beach, the Bay Trail construction, Dodson Marsh Atlas, th those are huge. Those were $50 million in projects. And we tend to give the money amount, how much they cost. We don't give the job amount. And uh, that's something we're going we're gonna to formalize that thanks to Lisa and Eric's help within our capital projects department to be able to keep good track of how many people uh, these contractors are employing because I, I think it's a far greater number than we have thought. Excellent. So it, do we do we have a good figure on Bay Point Albany Beach that's uh, being generated since it's uh, newly completed? Uh, that's that's what we'll be digging into. I know we can get those numbers. The contractors are pretty straightforward on who the construction was. So. A lot of the main contractor are doing the subcontractors and they obviously are keeping track of that. So I think we can and, and, and we'll do it even better in the future. Okay. All right, if there's nothing further, we'll move to SB 1060. Sure, um, so, so under some of the dictates of leadership um, in the legislature, um, members were asked to um, reduce or cull some of the bills from their legislative packages. This particular bill did not get a, uh, is not scheduled to be heard as I recall, um, but it shouldn't dissuade you from moving forward and supporting the concept, which is and the bill would require Department of Parks and Recreation to uh, register uh, eligible trails as important historical resources like historic structures, points of interest. Um, as the staff um, summary points out, there's a potential that we could, there's a few trails in um, that we operate, maintain, or work in collaboration with that could, um, to make that, that could, could be designated as such. And uh, the concept is very good. Uh, very worthy of supporting. And in case um, board members are, are wondering, I do not believe there's any funding associated with this. It's just a, a designation. But um, I think as we have seen with other uh, things that get designated in a higher level, um, it brings different attention and, and different signage and uh, you know makes more of a there there. So I, I thought that this would be a good uh, good thing to support now, knowing that it probably will be a few years before it, it truly comes online, given our, our current situation. Well, you know, I'm very enthusiastic about this, and and, um, and it would mean a lot for um, some of the statewide trails. And there's, you know, there's plenty of those. And um, so to help promote the historic qualities of those trails, I think would be a really positive thing. Great, any other comments, questions on this? Hearing none, we have received a report on four uh, bills that, oh, I, pardon me, Doug, go I'm ahead. Sorry, I'm sorry, I was having difficulty with my muting device there, but I just wanted to point out to you folks relative to this bill, in my capacity in working with the California Bicycle Coalition low 12 years ago, we advanced a piece of legislation. It's actually on the books and never been practiced or utilized or imp implemented. And, and it was a bill that creates um, a program through parks working with Caltrans to identify 
uh, routes of state, federal, and regional significance. Now these are routes, they're not trails necessarily, but I just, I just uh, point that out uh, because I recall there was a lot of um, interest around this particular bill for the, is it called the Great uh, Delta Trail? Mm -hmm. and the possibilities relative to that. Um, it's something worth looking at um, if you guys are interested in trying to advance or create more awareness around the importance of trails. It's just never been utilized, but it's on the books. Huh. And um, Doug, if I can follow up, does the Great Delta Trail, how, how much of the park district does it run through or does it? I don't know. I'd have I it, defer to you guys. Yeah, I'll answer that. So it 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 basically runs along the entire East County shoreline. Mm. Uh, it picks up where the Bay Trail ends. It kind of picks up, um, and we're we're already implementing pieces of it. In fact, I think Bay Point will be a piece of it. Um, so uh, that is important. We also have the uh, Congressman Desanye's bill um, that we, which was a authority uh, to put in a, uh, a fee for part for trails, but uh, we, we always check that on the polling. Um, so I, I think again, to beat the drum that there's no better example uh, today than the regional trail system being the capacity builder for this huge surge of people. Um, I, I just keep thinking about if we did not have the regional trails, what would our parks look like? <laughs> They're already full. Um, so I, anything we can do to support uh, green transportation like we did with Tiger with all the help that Peter did and Eric and the staff. Um, but I, I think this is something for the future. More cities will be looking at as well as how we move people without putting them in a bus uh, because that's going to be a restricted uh, transportation mode. The crowds are still going to be very restricted. So the more people we can put out to get outside on a trail to connect to business and shopping and parks is going to be really critical. All right. Um, if there are no further comments, uh, as we discussed before, I will accept a motion to um, move that we support all four of these bills and uh, present them to the full board for support. Uh, do I have a motion for that? So moved. Okay, we have a motion by Director Eccles. And I'll second it. And a second by Member Lane. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, um, Madam Clerk, would you uh, do a roll call vote? Um, okay. My apologies, a few technical difficulties. Uh, yes, uh, Beverly Lane. Aye. Director Eccles, sorry. Aye. Chair Waspy. Aye. Uh, motion passes unanimously. Thank you very, very much, Doug. And we'll move, oh, we're still on Doug. We'll move to the Governor Newsom's May re budget revise. Uh, does anybody else want to take this? I'm, I don't want to be the Grim Reaper. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> I mean, um, things are looking pretty bleak. I've been in this business for nearly three decades. Uh, I've seen a lot of really difficult budgets come through the process. I, I was here for ERAF 1 and 2, and I hate to sort of evoke that term or invoke that term because um, that specter may still haunt us today. Um, if we can't close this budgetary gap, but as your summary describes, um, the governor's May revise is projecting that we're going to be looking at a $54 billion deficit. And it also identifies uh, the ways in which um, this budget will try to address that. And um, none of them are... Um, are good options or good alternatives, obviously. Um, I know that, and hopefully we'll hear some something from Peter, I'm sure we will, you know, um, a lot of the cuts that have been identified to, to areas that are of particular interest and import to us, including fish and wildlife and 
state parks are, are going to be predicated on, on federal aid. And, you know, my intelligence suggests that things are trending positively back in D.C. and that money will uh, be forthcoming, hopefully to the states, uh, fingers crossed. But in the meantime, um, we're dealing with what we're terming this particular revise is an interim budget. And we suspect that the real budget will likely be crafted in August after um, some of our income tax um, projections uh, come clo become closer to reality. We start to see some revenues or lack of revenues start to come in at that juncture. Um, we'll know more about what's happening back in DC. So this is just more or less, the revise is sort of a stopgap budget. Um, uh, and it's, it's, it's put together primarily so that the legislature can can work on something, get their budget passed by June 15th, which is the uh, constitutional deadline. But um, in the meantime, there's, there's gonna be negotiations. There's several areas of the budget um, and cuts in particular that, that aren't sitting well with a number of legislators. So, this, this isn't a fait accompli. I think there's going to be a lot of give and take and uh, between the legislature and the administration. And, and I would not be surprised that the climate bond or economic recovery bond or resources bond does resurface in the context of some of these discussions. So that's my report for now. It is a very um, dire uh, situation. And uh, when you look at, uh, probably most of you have seen that the unemployment rate started to slow down and then went back up again uh, for filings for unemployment. Um, this budget also includes a 10% cut in state staffing um, and not in the staffing, but two uh, salaries, um, which is a, another uh, real big impact. Um, and uh, I know that Director Lane had a question about uh, the N3 funding that was in the general fund. Uh, should that move forward? Um, right now, uh, that has been cut 15 million of the 20 that was put in for a new state park. And uh, the remaining five is not specific to any, any area. Um, and so I, I would say that, that that funding is at risk and the fact that the property owner um, has not uh, come to realistic terms on the uh, property, which requires two appraisals. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think that's at risk. Um, I would also, and Doug, I'd like you to comment on this. My understanding that the 30 million cut to state park operating funds which you, which, when you think about that, this is an agency has not recovered from the recession, the last recession. Um, that thirty million dollar cut, I understand, was also a projection based on the gas tax money that state parks are supposed to um, obtain from the gas tax, and because the gasoline sales are so down, uh, good for air pollution, uh, but uh, it it does. Uh, greatly impact the state park. Um, state park director uh, negotiated in Prop 1 a very good negotiation for state parks as part of that. And, and that was my understanding. Part of the reason for that cut was the unanticipated income not coming to the state from, from that. Um, so I think it's just, uh, it's pretty dire for state parks. Um, I, I that sounds right, Bob. I, I hadn't heard that uh, dynamic, but um, to the extent that, yeah, the, the gas tax revenues predicated on, on sales through Prop 1, they're, um, they're, down, they're, they're very suppressed, obviously. So the nexus is there. That, that makes perfect sense. Um. 
anyone like to add or ask questions? I um I did want to add that that there was some it was somewhat significant that the uh, Cal Fire funding remained at the same level as it was in January. So I think there's an understanding by the governor um, and all of us really that that we can't afford to have uh, a, a severe and catastrophic wildfire season uh, at the same time that we're dealing with with the impacts of the the virus. So. Um, I, I think that that's one area where um, there probably will continue to be some support, and we've been looking at that very closely with our delegation and with our with our fire team and and the general manager to see if there's additional funding for the park district. Great. I'm uh, I'm reluctant to ask because I probably should have asked this prior to the meeting, but I know that I've 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 got word from other clients that had received. Um, earmarks in last year's budget that those are being swept away are we did we didn't we receive money with was it McCosker last year how is yes. can yes can tell anybody share the status of that is that something we need to continue to fight for well, moving to forward on that contract we're going to have to continue to advocate for that um, but what we're since we have been through this several times Doug uh, we're we're locking in those those grant contract agreements uh, as fast as we can, and we're we're out the door um, with these projects. So we're, you know, the the magic word for me in these time is encumber, encumber, encumber. <laughs> uh, we've got to lock those monies in because that's where they sweep. And that I, I think the N three is a good example. There was no progress uh, between negotiators, so um, there it went. Um, but we're we're fully. Uh, ready to go and are going on McCosker. And if I may chime in on McCosker, Eric and I spoke with Rebecca Bauer Cahan's uh, staff uh, last week and they shared with us just their continued support for the project, recognizing the access, the, the need for environmental access at this time, in addition, the jobs that such a large construction project creates for the community. And so we do continue to have their support. I, I guess my question, oh, my question is, are do we do we know the money is still there? Is it being part of the sweep? Has it been identified as part of the sweep? Are we hearing anything that would suggest that that money's going away, or are we far enough down? That we've gone through the contracting, we've encumbered. They probably can't then. Um, they probably can't take that money back necessarily if we've gone that far down the road. I would imagine. Uh, it, uh, Doug, is, our experience really is, is that it's, it's a gradient of how secure the, the easy stuff gets swept first. And then as it gets tighter and tighter, they start looking at ways to, to sweep it all. So our, what we're trying to do, and this is the highest priority in our capital projects and grants is to lock down the money we have. We still have money for Del Val that is being spent. So we have the, the water system and the interpretive system, I think. The fact that uh, con construction can start up again and has started up again is really important. Um, so there, there, we actually pulled where the contractors pulled their staff back when the shelter in place uh, was put forward. And now they've come back and are saying, we really wanna get our people back to work. So that's a good sign. Uh, but that, that hiatus has been a, was a concern because they weren't working, but now they are. On all and these we do have problems. an executed and signed grant agreement from a Costco. So it's under contract. Great. Okay. That's a good step. I'll Great. say. Um, so I have a question on the uh, Cal Fire amounts. Um, so are these amounts um, likely to make a difference in terms of Cal Fire's um, functioning and ability to fight fires, or is it still too little? The the figure, and I should have clarified that Beverly in the in the staff memo, but the the figure in there is additional money to their what their base budget was. So that eighty seven million is what they're calling surge funding, which means uh, it's it's an extra infusion to try to do more pre disaster mitigation um, more quickly. Okay, so it's in addition at least. 
And, and there was a specific reference to new hiring uh, for firefighting. Um, there, there was a number, I don't have the number here, but there was a number of uh, like 600 new, uh, new firefighters. The, the, the complexity here is we were just told yesterday that Cal Fire was prepared to, to actually close down some stations because of the budget. And I haven't seen this squared with the proposal versus their, let's say their plan to reduce their costs. But we were notified that several uh, fire stations, of Cal Fire fire stations in, in the Bay Area were being looked at to be closed um, temporarily. So um, I think we have to really focus um, with communication with Cal Fire, you know, does this money make up for that? or or what and it's really possible and we've seen this before that you know a week this is also dynamic that a week ago it was everybody prepared to shut things down and reduce their budget and then the budget moves forward which is still a proposal and it has money so i i don't think they're reacting in real time but i, I we were definitely told by cal fire this week that they're looking at reductions um, and I, but i don't know that that's relevant to what we're talking about with the budget itself right now. I don't know if that's gone down through the system to, to, to communicate that, but what we will be paying a lot of attention to that. Well, so if they do close, um, does that mean they would make use of our stations in it, a different way? It means that the conversation that has happened, I feel like this is deja vu. <laughs> uh, the conversation that has happened is asking us to cover some of those areas, um, particularly East Contra Costa County. And we, we have to see how far up the ranks that is. As you know, what happens usually is um, the, the senior management says, you need to reduce each one of these areas, regions, budgets by so much, come up with a plan. They move that plan forward. And I think they're coming up with a plan and saying, well, we better talk to our partners but the, the discussion that I um, had was that they're, they're seeing what more we could do for them to cover some of the areas. And I don't know if that means we'll give you the money to run it out of your shop or whether we just need your help. Um, and I think that's very dynamic and not decided yet, but we are paying a close attention to it. Thanks. Hmm. Anyone else? Uh, any comments on uh, yeah, the state just, of the state? Yeah, I'll just chime in a little bit. So, um, you know, what my understanding is, is that the, the governor is asking all state agencies to uh, implement a 5% cut to operating expenses. But that fortunately is not going into effect until the next budget year. So it's not as of July 1st, there was some you know, rumors that it would be July 1st, but but ultimately it's the, the following budget year. So agencies have some time to, to adjust, but Cal Fire, they may have additional directions, but they would be certainly looking now to figure out how can we tighten our belt in the future. The 10% give back in wages that, that Bob talked about um, is, is effective July 1st. That's subject to um, employee uh, well, uh, union negotiations, of course, as well as um, the hope that more money will come from from the feds. Um, so that is in the bucket of things that can be addressed if if there's more money from the federal government. Although you know there's a number of very important priorities that are that are in that same bucket, like like um, education and other spending. So it's a uh, yeah, it's it's definitely a a, a grim picture. Elizabeth, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Um, of course, they're going to start planning ahead of for course, what they yeah. might have to close in those reductions. We've done the same thing. And so that, that makes a lot of sense. All right. Well, um, <laughs> I don't know what to say, but um, we can hope for the best. And um, <laughs> the next item is other any other state matters? Hearing none. Doug, thanks very much for being here. Stay safe. 
uh, and you're welcome to stay if you want. I'll stay on uh, we'll for a while. To, all right, we'll move to federal legislation. Um, and once again, we have a we have five um, bills that we're asked to support, and we'll do it again. In, in we'll hear reports, and then we'll vote on that as a whole. So. Um, Peter and Eric, I'm not sure who wants to start off, but our first uh, is HR 5642 by Jared Huffman. I guess I'll, I'll start and would welcome um, Peter's insights for sure. Uh, this, this bill was um, actually something we were looking at prior to um, the shelter in place uh, because it was a pretty exciting proposal that um, Jared Huffman uh, wanted to set aside money in the transportation program for federal lands, specifically for active transportation. Currently, there's not a um, requirement that if you are spending money from a uh, transportation program for the land, for for federal lands, that you have to put any anything in other than just pavement for uh, parking lots or roads. Um, so, so this bill would actually require a 5% set aside specifically for paved trails. Um, and so that's a that's an exciting possibility. Um, so we thought it would be a good thing to support knowing that um, right now is, is maybe not, uh, the political climate may not be embracing this specifically, but uh, we do think it is something consistent with our previous support of active transportation programs. Hmm. Any can, questions, comments from board members? Good. I can just add on the bill itself. It's a it's very consistent as Eric had reported uh, with our past you know goals and support for legislation that would focus active transportation in a way that is helpful to the park district. This issue of a set aside has always been a sticking point with Republican members in both the House and Senate when it comes to negotiating a transportation bill. You may remember when Chairwoman Boxer was in charge and handling the last transportation bill, This, the funding for bicycle and pedestrian trails was literally the last issue that was negotiated and resolved before the transportation bill would moved in the Senate and moved out of conference. So. Um, just remains a sticking point, but that should not stop the Park District from continuing to advocate for a growing sector of transportation, which is active transportation. We're just seeing it more and more as the memo describes the increase in, in use. And um, so it's an important bill, but it bumps up against the political challenges that have been negotiated in past transportation bills. Okay, um, if there are no further comments, we'll move to um, HR 5797, Recreational Trails Program Full Funding Act. And similarly, this was a bill that we were looking at uh, pre-shelter um, in place that would actually allocate uh, a, a specific amount of funding for the Recreational Trails Program. Um, to Peter's point on the transportation bill, this was one of the programs that really got um, entangled in the negotiation at the end of uh, the last federal comprehensive transportation bill. And I think what the representative Welsh is, is trying to do is, is put down a marker for future negotiations in a overall transportation bill, whether that be a standalone reauthorization or uh, possibly something associated with a stimulus package that could be moved later in the year for the economy. Um, but the, the interesting thing about this bill to me in a way is it, it kind of parallels what we have been talking about at the state level with the OHV account, um, that there's more, way more money in those accounts than is being allocated to programs that they're supposed to fund. And L LWCF is the same way. So um, they're collecting, what what is projected to be about 270 million uh, annually for um, from you know snowmobiles and, and other off-road uh, uh, vehicles and they're only allocating somewhere in the neighborhood of about 80 million um, to the to the recreational trails program so 
I think just for the same reasons that we just talked about with the, the Huffman bill, this is another one that I think it, we, is consistent with our, our support of trails and it also is um, calling attention to the fact that the funding should be going to uh, <laughs> should be going to what we say it's supposed to go to. So um, anyway, I don't know if Peter has anything else on that, but I think it's a good good bill and, and a good marker to lay down for the next transportation bill authorization. I agree with everything you, you said, Eric. I, I believe it's one worthy of uh, the park district support. Excellent. Any board member comments? All right. I think we are all in agreement with you. So we'll move now to um, uh, Senate Bill 3263 and HR 5845, uh, Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that this was, again, a bill that we were looking at before. Um, but it is interesting to see the, the parallels between some of what's happening in the state and what's happening in, in, in DC. Um, we had the 30 for thir our 30 uh, by 30 bill uh, earlier, um, talking about some of the, the funding for active transportation. And then this, this is very similar to the legislation at the state level and also the ballot initiative that's being proposed to uh, reduce the amount of plastic. Um, and it, it, this goes a little farther than the state bill because it puts in place a uh, federal bottle bill, a 10 cent um, deposit on every container. And then it also uh, bans export of plastic to countries that can't handle the waste. Um, and I think that's actually a very important um, issue because uh, if, you, if you do go to countries that can't handle it, there's just plastic everywhere. Um, and then it also uh, calls for a, a recycled content by 2040 of 80% in any new, new plastic related products. Um, so I don't know, Peter, if there's real momentum in DC to move something like this, but I do think it's 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 almost identical to the things that we've supported at the state level. So I think it's it's worthy of the district's support. I, I agree that it's a it's a worthy bill to for the district to support that there has been a, a growing effort to look at ways to address plastic pollution. Um, I don't see that kind of consensus that you would see around this bill yet, but I think it's this is an important first bill and constructive to force this debate. And I'm sure it will be a part of legislation, if not this year, and um, in the, in, within the next year or so. Um, there's this increasing tension of this on a nationwide basis. So um, I just don't know if it has momentum this year with everything else that's in the legislative pipeline. Any questions, comments from board members? Okay, more aspirational, right? Yes. Um, the only thing that I would add is it's a darn shame. I wish it were, <laughs> wish it could happen, but um, maybe another time. Um, if there is nothing further, we'll move to um, Senate Bill 3366 and HR 5998, the free national parks and federal recreation land pass for Gold Star families. And it pretty much, the title pretty much explains it. Um, the idea is to allow uh, families who have, or direct family members who have uh, lost somebody in the service uh, to have free access to Fred federally managed uh, public lands. Um, so it's consistent with some of the, um, the legislation that we've all, all, all supported on uh, providing veterans access to federal lands. And now this would provide uh, gold star families uh, free access as well. Excellent, any questions, comments? Um, hearing none, I, my only comment would be, I think Director Rosario brought up um, a long time ago when we talked about another uh, bill like this, I, I hope, or we were looking into the feasibility of the regional parks doing this also. That seems like a worthy cause and 
and even, well, Gold Star families for sure, but even maybe all veterans and their families. But uh, is there, I don't know if it was this committee or it might have been um, operations with Jim O'Connor might be looking into that. Does anybody know? I, I do, and I don't know, I can't see other faces, so I don't know if, if Robert has a comment on it or not, but I, I do think it was something that operations was looking at in terms of potential cost. Um, but I, I, I think that I had heard that it wasn't actually all that, all that significant of a cost to the district. I, I don't believe it is. Yeah. And um, also we already give uh, significant discounts to veterans, including free passes. Um, so I think Jim was gonna look at the difference between what the increment would be, um, but we, we certainly want to, and we have a lot of staff that uh, have been veterans. And so we, we wanna do uh, what we can to support them. So I'll, I'll have Jim take another look and bring that back, find out where that is. All right, great, thank you. Um, if there are no further comments, we'll move to um, Senate Bill 3391 uh, and HR uh, 5696, Connecting America's Active Transportation Systems Act. So again, another um, active transportation bill, uh, and then this is this is specific to um, uh, connecting um, regional trails and and making sure that there's a uh, more of a national system and national con consciousness about it. Uh, the price tag is pretty pretty big, frankly, um, 500 million for each of the five fiscal years that it would apply to. Um, and then again, I think this is something that. Uh, probably is a marker for a future transportation bill. I, I should have pointed out, and um, Peter can correct me if I'm if I'm not correct, um, but that uh, you know the, re the the when when Senator Boxer compromised on the last transportation bill, a lot of these programs got put into one pot and were sort of given to states as a block grant, meaning federal dollars for active transportation and recreational trails and safe routes to schools and some other um, transportation enhancement money, those were all put into one lump sum and uh, states uh, would be given the funding and they could decide what to use it for. And in some cases, if you didn't want the rec trails program, uh, if you didn't want to use it for rec trails, you could actually opt out of it. Uh, so I think what we're seeing with some of these bills that are moving through now are trying to separate um, those programs again and get and get them back to kind of being more independent and more uh, reliant on direct funding. Um, and I, from a park district standpoint, I think that that's actually beneficial because we have more ability, more grant programs, more ability to apply for different categories. And we do have recreational trails that aren't, um, you know, aren't active transportation trails, and they they we also need funding for that. So I, I think. I'm seeing a trend, and I don't know if Peter would agree, but I'm seeing a trend of trying to separate those categories back out, which I actually think is is a positive thing for the district. I agree with everything you said, Eric, and just add that this bill specifically identifies multi-county special districts. So definitely worthy of the park district support. That is a phrase that I worked with Senator Cardin and others on now five years ago. <laughs> took some work, but um, it is definitely an important bill, a good marker at this juncture in time where there's ongoing conversations about a transportation bill. I would say it's less than a 50% chance that a transportation slash infrastructure bill happens this year, but um, you need to be ready. And this is a good way to make sure that park district's voice is involved in the discussions and this is a good bill and, and i um, i do want to thank peter for all his work on getting special park districts included in a lot of different bills um, it's been kind of our mantra and i know all of you have been to dc and we talk about it every time we we go but uh, peter has had quite a bit of success in getting that language into different bills and um, uh, that will speak to the next uh, piece of um, the next item that we're going to talk about but um, it's very important to have that in there as in as many places as possible so it's um so it's repeated so thanks for that that work peter any questions comments from board members 
I agree. Thank you, Peter. Um, so we've yes. concluded. Oh, pardon me. Go it's ahead. It's also really important. Um, it's one thing thing to be legally interpretive as it allows for us to get it, but um, even now with some of the uh, funding that's coming out of Washington, if it doesn't specifically name uh, special districts, uh, it, it is a, it's a bigger challenge, even if we qualify. And so having that specific language really helps because if we're competing with a county or the state for the same bucket of money and, and special districts aren't specifically referenced, it just says, well, it's kind of iffy, so we won't give you any money. <laughs> so it, it's a competitive process and the counties and the states are all looking for more money so having a, a park district, you know, say, please give us some money uh, is a challenge. So the more more specific we can be and the more, and Peter's also done this in our ledge staff um, is define some of these projects. So the actual definition of the purpose is more specific, like has to be a class one trail or has to, you know, those, uh, what we were so successful with Tiger was it was, it was to complete the system and we had a lot of categories in the definition that made us more competitive. And, and I know Peter and Eric will recall when we went on that and it says, what is a special district? Um, do you, are you the contractor for Cal, for, uh, you know, Caltrans? So we've come a long ways and uh, successfully. So we got to keep a lot of a lot of states don't have special districts. A lot of agencies don't know what they are. So it's it's a constant uphill push to recognize what we do as a park agency that includes transportation. And I know Beverly will remember this, um, and obviously the general manager will too, but th there was a program passed, I think in the 90s, uh, called uh, Urban Parks and Area Recreation, I, I believe. It was commonly known as UPAR. UPAR. Written in a way that uh, cities and counties were eligible specifically, but park districts were not eligible. So we never were able to compete for that funding. And so it's been reintroduced, and Peter, I can't remember the, the acronym for the, for the bill now, but they've reintroduced a version of it that we were able to successfully get special districts included in. So it's it, moving forward, we should be covered, but um, that was a glaring omission when, um, when UPAR went through. And, yep. and uh, not to repeat a lot of history here, but um, when when CARA, which was the big lands bill under uh, Bill Clinton, uh, when that was approved, George Miller had stuck uh, money in for UPAR specifically that we would have qualified for. And then at the last minute of the negotiations, that got cut way back. But um, that was a very hot, hot uh, subject for Congressman Miller at the time, very supportive of UPAR. Um, and for the brief time that he was the chair of the Natural Resources Committee, he had really advocated for urban parks and uh, it, we just need those champions. All right. Um, okay, so if there is no further comments uh, by board members or anyone, staff or anyone, um, we do have the opportunity to recommend to the full board support of these five bills that we've just heard descriptions of. Uh, do I have a motion to move this ahead? So move. Second. Motion by Member Lane and a second by Member Eccles. Uh, Yuli, will you take the census, please? Roll, please. Director Beverly Lane. Aye. Director Elizabeth Eccles. Aye. Chair Director Dennis Waspy. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll recommend these for support to the full board. Thank you all for your presentations. Uh, and our next item is now the HEROES Act. And I guess I'll, I'll, I'll start by saying um, we worked very hard on the CARES Act um, to seek funding um, for COVID-19 expenditures for the district. And it was Peter's catch that, that uh, made us realize that we were actually probably were eligible given that we have a population base of about 2.7, 2.8 million people that we serve. Um, the floor on the CARES Act was 500,000 population. So 
we were one of the few entities in, in the Bay Area, frankly, that were eligible. Uh, so we applied. Um, we also made a, a request to the state because at the time that it passed, nobody knew exactly how the money would, would be passed down. Uh, the way that it has seemed to have evolved is that has been passed down to the counties. And, uh, you know, as the general manager points out, the counties are highly unlikely to, I mean, they're, they're, they're hurting too, so they're hard, highly unlikely to be passing that money through to us. I think we will make, make them aware, aware that we are eligible. Um, but so having gone through that um, experience and that um, lesson, I guess, uh, we've been much more proactive on the HEROES uh, Act, which is the next wave of funding that should include uh, state and local assistance funding. And so for all the things that we were just talking about with getting special districts eligible, um, this is one where we're really trying to work pretty hard with our, our delegation to make sure that we are. Uh, we are getting some help from the Special Districts Association. Uh, however, I think it is our government affairs staff and, and, and uh, advocate Umhofer's position that they're being a little too specific um, in their asks and what we really want to just have that line item that says, you know, cities, counties, and special districts are eligible. So um, I think at that, with that, I I'd probably turn it over to Peter for the more, uh, you know, on the ground where this is headed and what the timing is, but it's important to just know that the timing of this, as Doug indicated, is definitely really, and, and, and Director Eccles indicated, is definitely related to the state budget because there's a, there's a, the triggers in the state budget are, are di directly reliant upon um, this funding at the, at the federal level. And I think if you, um, if you heard it in, in the governor's May revise speech, it was practically a, a uh, advocacy um, statement for Speaker Pelosi to move this funding through. So um, with that, I think I'll let Peter maybe go into a little bit more of the details and then happy to answer additional questions. Sure. Let me just briefly touch on the HEROES Act. $500 billion for states in that bill, $375 billion for local government. And it's broken out into two separate buckets. Uh, 250 immediately goes in 30 days to localities, meaning counties and cities, and then a little bit within a year's time, another $125 billion. Would, would be dispersed. It'd be based on community development block, block grant formula and also based another portion of it would be based on population. But I just want to make sure going back to governors asking for 500 billion for states, that is reflective in the HEROES Act. 375 billion for localities is desperately needed as we all know. Mayors are weighing in in a very aggressive way with both House members and senators now. I, in terms of the timing, the Senate has been spending not much time except behind closed doors, Senate Republicans mostly, trying to figure out what to do um, on this, what I refer to as a phase five bill. Senator McConnell said yesterday to the president, he does not want to do a bill that's more than a trillion dollars. So if 500 billion is in it for states and some amount in for localities, it doesn't leave much for more than maybe some additional money for the small business paycheck protection program and a few other items. Senator McConnell may be thinking that it, in conference, a bill is 2 trillion, but still it doesn't provide, it doesn't give me a lot of comfort that $1 trillion is gonna be available to state and local governments for fiscal relief in time to be helpful um, before states have to start making cuts. But mayors, governors, and a variety of other stakeholders are weighing in directly with Senate Republicans, noting to them that their fiscal years start on July 1 and that they're gonna to have to start making tough decisions by mid-June, and so they need to act. The earliest I see the Senate acting is June 26th, when they would break for, quote unquote, 
the July 4th recess. My, my sense of things right now and the rhythm that things are going, they're not going to start negotiating seriously for a couple more weeks. And so this is going to carry over until at least, and they don't get a deal until August 1. That's my sense of things at the moment. Um, Senate Republicans are focused on liability relief for businesses and maybe some additional money for the Paycheck Protection Program. Democrats have laid out many of their priorities. The Senate Democrats are very supportive of what's in the HEROES Act. The White House is focused on a payroll tax cut and an ability to, for businesses to do some additional expensing. So that's where things stand. I'm happy to answer questions if people have questions about timing. The Republicans are just really split right now. They've spent two weeks, every lunch period, um, and they're split between ones that want to give a lot of money and to help assist state and localities, others that don't want to provide any, and some that are want to provide just a little bit. And they can't get to yes and they can't figure it out, but pressure is going to build on them and maybe time will tell. But again, the rhythm of things is Republicans want to, most Republicans want to wait and see how the 2.2 trillion has been spent to date before they pass additional funding. That's painful. It's not the answer I know people want to hear, but that's where things are at the moment. Any questions, comments? So one one um, thing that I am curious about, and I don't think we know the answer yet, but assuming that the federal money doesn't come by June 15th or even July 1st, then our budget at the state level, the triggers would start to move forward. But if the federal money were to be available, let's say end of August, could we use it to backfill some of the triggered cuts um, or, or at least stop the triggered cuts at that time. And I, I see Doug turn his screen back on. I maybe, maybe he has some insight into that, but I, I just, I, I'm curious about that because I, I, I think I get the, I get the pressure of the triggers to try to get spur action, but is the reality such that it really would have, they would have to go into effect that quickly or could, is there some possibility that we forget the money later? It would, it would make those triggers go away. I don't know if I have an answer to that, Eric. Honestly, yeah. Um, no, I, 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 I mean, don't really know. the triggers. The triggers are going to be pulled. Um, the wheels will be set in motion. Um, can you slow or stop the wheels in light of future federal aid? Probably. I mean, yeah, government's slow to act and react and adapt, but. Um, I think there's 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 hope that that would transpire. Sure. I, I can keep going if you want me to, or other questions. Uh, does anyone have any other questions or comments? Okay, <laughs> give us some good news, Peter. Okay. Uh, Congressman Garamendi has a bill that he will introduce on Wednesday called the Special Districts Provide Essential Service Act. This is a bill that will make sure that special districts are eligible for state and local government fiscal relief funding. And it's explicit. So um, Congressman Garamendi, Congressman Huffman, many of our other friends, they've heard from water utilities, ports, and other special districts. And so I've been in touch with Congressman Garamendi's office. They would like a letter of support from the park district for their efforts and for their bill. I would definitely recommend that. They've done a lot of good work. They are looking for a Republican, House Republican co-sponsor I identified Ohio special park districts as one area that they could potentially pursue. I don't know 
um, General Manager Doyle, if you have good relationships with anybody that comes to mind anywhere in the country that's a park district, um, and I can do the cross-referencing to see if they've got a Republican representative or not, but they're looking for help. I think uh, Eric and I can put our heads together. We had done some significant work with the other special districts and the special district forum. And my sense is back east, there are there are some significant park agencies with Republican board members as well as uh, Congress members. So uh, I'm sure that we can we can look at that. Just, just to, OK, thank you just to make sure people understand the bill does, it would make special districts eligible for 5% of funds directed to states, counties, and local governments. So it's as good as it can get. Um, I just wish from all of my conversations over the last week that there was less parallel tracking and more fusion and more collaboration going on. Um, there's just too much stovepiping on this special district issue, okay. but I'm trying to do the best to bridge those gaps as much as I can, but it's not easy. Peter, we'll talk to you offline and develop a strategy for how you want to tackle that. Okay. Um, so that's some good news and um, I'll be sure to be in touch. The other thing is I'm very hopeful that Senator Harris will step up and introduce this bill in the Senate. Um, Senator Feinstein and Senator Harris have both been in support of a, another bill that would direct funding for localities under 100, under 500,000 people. So that was, this is another bill that was introduced in April, both the House and Senate that would direct 250 billion for localities under 500,000. And I got a lot of support very quickly but I think they know that they need to do more. So I'm hopeful that Senator Harris will step up. I've had some conversations with their office, but again, I'll take it offline about some ideas I have there, maybe how they can maybe step forward a little more than they have. Secondly, some good news. The Green American Outdoors Act will be on the Senate floor on June 1st. There is just an amazing amount of effort just so people understand, this is S3422. It's the Land and Water Conservation Fund permanent funding, 900 million annually, and uh, 9.5 billion over five years for public land maintenance. So that's parks, forests, BLM lands, Fish and Wildlife Service, refuges. Pretty significant. Amazing amount of change in the last 24 or 48 hours where a lot of people thought this wasn't happening, but some fascinating political dy dynamics in play where some senators that are strong advocates for this happen to be Republicans are up for in tough reelections and made the case again with Senator McConnell to bring up the bill. So Senator Gardner in Colorado, Senator Daines and Senator Burr all have lots of been advocating on the bill, but also have their own political challenges. So the House does not have a bill. Um, they have a bill that has not been marked up. So if the Senate does act and it does pass, then there'll be pressure on the House to take it up. Um, so good news there. And hopefully it can make it across the Senate floor. I, I'm cautiously optimistic just because we're getting into that political season where an amendment comes up and then slows things down and then the bill has to be pulled or they have to work out an agreement. So I'm hopeful that we're not into the, having amendments that slow things down this bill can, a lot of people worked on it for a long, long time and it could be a, could be a nice, nice win. And they're talking a lot about jobs as something will happen out of this too, I'm assuming. Yes, yes. I, I, I think it's great. Um, the earlier part of our conversation about having economic job, uh, I mean, job creation mm -hmm. figures associated with projects is essential and important and will be very helpful, I'm sure, for 
state as well as federal um, advocacy going forward here um, in this very difficult time we're going to face as a nation. Okay, so should should we be talking to our congressional representatives about this particular bill? Um, uh, yeah, I, I think we're okay on with Senator Feinstein and Senator Harris, but um, I will come back on what to do next with the House delegation. Yeah, I'm talking about the House. Yep. Lastly, appropriations bills, the funding bills for agencies and programs. There's momentum there. Could start to move in this early to mid-June timeframe. So I'll keep everyone up to speed on that, but there's progress being made. It's been a little slower in the Senate, but hopefully that will start very soon here, but it could be a challenge just because of the time we're in. That's all I have. I'm happy to answer questions. Just wanted to just add on the land and water piece that prior to uh, shelter in place, the, the president had actually tweeted support for it. So uh, if it makes it through the, the Congress, um, he's on record. I mean, I don't know if he, he goes on and off record on a lot of things, but he's on record to support. Yeah. Great. Any questions, comments by board members? It, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'm just wondering if, if uh, with land and water, if we do need to send something um, specific and to our uh, congressional reps you know, that, that doesn't talk about anything else. It just talks about that. It, it's always helpful to have a a letter of support or a, a short statement that endorses the bill because sometimes those are read on the Senate floor by um, your senator. So um, it's, a, it's a good reminder, Beverly, to have um, to consider doing that. It, it's this could be a pretty historical bill. And so being on record with representatives in the Senate and in the House. Um, is definitely worthy. It's timely and worthy, I think, if it's what people want to do. We can we can certainly do that. Uh, as the board may recall, we have had several op-eds we have published supporting Land and Water Conservation Fund, and we could resend resend those. Anything we do, Peter's right there to deliver it to the offices. And well, I don't know if you can still do that, Peter. <laughs> um, it, it's a lot more emailing than um, yeah. and delivery these days, but um, there's always ways to get in touch with our friends. This has uh, been a long, long-term effort and it's always surprising even in the bad situation with some, uh, Pat O'Brien always called it the, the the little dinosaurs between the toes of the big dinosaurs and something gets in and saved. <laughs> so this could be not too small a dinosaur, but the money's there and land and water is just critical for so many reasons. Uh, there has been talk locally um, in a lot of the webinars with other park agencies about land and water. And so uh, we're, we're keeping the keeping the cheerleading going for sure, but we're happy to write another, another letter. Okay, and you know, we have been successful in using uh, these funds on different projects over the years. And I know we have a pretty good um, documentation of that. So maybe one of the things we could do is pick uh, pick one in each congressional districts, um, each congressional congressional district, and say, for example, in your district, even with not very much money, we were able to. So something that's a, an example. Um, I think it would, might be helpful at this point. Thank you, Beverly. Um, and we uh, we have no better example than the co current competitive grant we got at Bay Point. Um, and that's the one where uh, Eric and Lisa did the work to show that as 200 people were employed as part of that. So that's a current, uh, very low income area, very diverse communities. It's, it's got all the right tickets because it was a competitive land and water grant. And so that's a good example, and we'll, we, I'm sure we have others. Thank you, Beverly. 
All right, if there's no further comments, um, I, I would only say that um, procedurally, um, Peter, you mentioned the letter to Senator, I mean, uh, Congressman Garamendi. Uh, do, do we just, as a committee, can we, because it's timely, right? We, would, we wouldn't yes. be able to, it would take some time to get the whole board to agree to this, but it, it's just a letter. We could agree to that as a committee. I'm asking the question. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> I think the ask would be to allow us to, or, or, or support us um, sending uh, a comment in support of the legislation. Uh, it was not, we, we, we didn't have it available. And actually I'm not even sure Peter, if it's in draft yet or not, but we didn't have the language available to bring and put into this board packet, this committee packet. Uh, so it wasn't on the agenda, but um, if we can, express some level of support now, we will definitely bring it back um, at our next meeting as, a, as an agendaized item. But, but well, Dennis, I, I, Dennis, I think the committee is fine with directing the general manager to draft a letter to send to John, uh, Congressman Garamendi. Uh, as you would recall, he was uh, in our district, Beverly. Um, he was well, the advocate. For, he was the advocate for Concord Naval Weapons Station for a while. We forget <laughs> how many districts have changed, but but uh, John was a very big supporter and knows the Park District well. Yeah, my, he was the one that said, "Isn't isn't there another jurisdiction overlooking this Concord Hills Park?" And he looked at the topo map and he said, "Couldn't Pittsburgh do something there?" I still remember that. Well, so would it be the will of this uh, committee to direct the general manager to write a letter to Congressman Garamendi uh, supporting this? Yeah, I'd support that, yes. Okay, great, uh, so be it. And you know, um, Peter, I was thinking that you were looking for a Republican. Um, I, I recall the special districts form back in Charleston, South Carolina, and I know that's getting very stereotypical or whatever the word is, but I bet there's a couple of um, Republicans back in South Carolina, and, and that was a great group of people uh, running that special district out there, so that might be a good resource. Unfortunately, I think that district is in Jim Clyburn's district. Oh, oh, okay. I, I thought of that too, but I, I think it's Clyburn's area. Okay. We will, we, have, we will double check it. Okay, then <laughs> here, all joking aside, Stark County, Ohio. <laughs> I know those people. Um, if there's nothing further uh, on federal matters, anything else? Peter, thank you so much. It's always great to see you. I hope everybody's safe back there and uh, enjoy the Memorial Day holiday. Thank you, um, great to see everyone as well. So we'll move to the uh, COVID updates, COVID-19 updates. Uh, who's? Well, I, I don't, the board has received uh, uh, many updates. You have two more going out today. Um, just just hit, the, hit the airwaves. And so uh, I, I think the big issue is um, the, this Memorial Day holiday. Uh, we have um, a whole number of new uh, PSAs going out the door uh, through media that will be running this weekend, asking people to bring a mask, wear a mask, and the same messaging, but they're actually through the health directors. Um, so we really have a, a great message there from the actual medical experts saying how important parks are, but to please follow the uh, social distancing. And I think you'll, we've sent those to the board already and they're, they really came out well, but we'll be having a heavy footprint on that uh, this week and because of the crowds. And uh, we're all hands on deck for this weekend, uh, public safety and, and operations. And uh, the, the benefit we have, if there is one, is that having the, you know, usually on a holiday weekend and towards the summer, it's all about swimming safety, all about our lakes, um, but our parks are open, but our swim areas are not open. Our picnic areas are still closed. Campgrounds are still closed. So we should be able to uh, survive this weekend and clean everything up uh, next week. So I'm sure it'll be very busy. It's gonna be warm, um, but uh, we're, we're prepared. And we, we, it's, if I think we had all the swim areas open this weekend, I, I think we'd be in a pretty difficult situation. Um, so Peter, please uh, 
tell our members back there and your contacts the district is fully operational, fully open and serving the public in this time. And uh, we got a great, great staff working hard to have the parks there for everybody. I, I surely will. And I appreciate all the effort by everyone. You know, it, it's, it, it, it's a tremendous time. It, it's a stressful time. And I, I know that people are really digging deep to do the best they can for the public. And I'll continue to convey that to the congressional delegation and continue to make the case for assistance in this difficult time. Would you and be sure you and tell DeSalme's staff how pleased we are that he's out of the hospital? Um, I, think he has, I don't think he's come I, back to California. Yeah, I, I've been in touch with them and they're excited to issue a statement of support for the Concord Hills Regional Park Land Use Plan. And um, so mm -hmm. they're working really, really hard right now to keep things going in the office. And I know that they're really pleased um, that he continues to make progress and recover. Right. And Peter, if, uh, if you have some people back there that would be interested, we could send you some examples of our PSAs. They're pretty, uh, they're pretty sophisticated and, and really out there, radio, TV, uh, even the newspapers. And so they're entertaining. <laughs> so okay. um, we'll have Eric or at least send some of those to you because they really, well, I don't think there's any park agency that has done as much on public messaging as we have anywhere. Um, and so really, really proud of that effort from everyone. I look forward yeah. to seeing that. Thank you. Yeah, we'll absolutely send those to you, Peter, because we had a, a conversation with NRPA staff not too long ago, uh, Lisa and I, um, about the PSAs, and they were eager to see them. So we definitely would like to get them to them. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's a good idea. With regard to this weekend, you know, we've been anticipating some big weekends in the past, and we've been fortunate in the uh, weather on those and that it hasn't been really as toasty as it might be, but I think this weekend is really gonna draw the, draw the people. There's no doubt about it. So yeah. um, apprehensive about it. Big challenge. I did, I did want to just to mention to the board, it's not really a COVID update, but I think the board knows that uh, uh, we had uh, three spills, uh, three at Temescal um, sewage spills. Uh, that that poor oasis just keeps getting continual. Um, in the last few years, we've been always told it's winter runoff. It, it's not winter runoff. It's it's continual lines that are being uh, not broken but blocked because of the system. And they are under it opens under an EPA order to uh, fix a lot of these problems. Temescal is a lower priority for them because it doesn't go as directly to the bay. And that's the EP order was really bay keeper lawsuit and others to protect the bay. Um, and so uh, we need to continue to struggle through this. But um, we were at, we filmed a lot of the PSAs at Temescal and I've never seen so many people. It just was a constant flow six feet apart of every kind of person we have in the East Bay and every type of recreation. And uh, to have that happen uh, during uh, the COVID increase in use and, and restrictions is really, really sad and frustrating. And uh, we, we don't seem to get much progress on it. Yeah, uh, well, I read uh, Dennis's email and um... I myself think we just need to perhaps do some different things. We yeah. need to um, put a net out and get other people besides ourselves to just start bouncing on this because this is, it's disgusting. Yeah. You know, besides not being acceptable, yeah. terrible. Yeah. And it's another pathogen for the virus. And uh, we're very, it's yeah. just, all the work we're trying to do to get people out in the parks and then we have to shut down. The park is open, but uh, there are just signs up everywhere and more tape and no fishing. It's a very popular fishing spot. 
Um, so it's just, it's very, very hard, but it's, uh, it's an antiquated system and Montclair area doesn't get the priority as the rest of, you know, Oakland has so many issues and so many problems that, it, you know, the bottom line is the squeaky wheel gets the grease and we need to continue. And we have had many meetings with the mayor and we've had many meetings with the public works department and we, we just don't seem to make much progress. It's, well, it's I just a, don't think that's working. Maybe we need to go. Yeah, we're, we're we'll, get the we'll, hill people involved, you know. Yeah. Well, the people who are impacted now are in strollers bringing their children along the lake. Um, yeah. I think they'd be upset. So, but that's the bad news. Uh, not good timing. Um, but uh, we'll, we're ready for the weekend and we'll do our best. Okay. Um... If there's nothing further on that, thanks for all your efforts, Robert. I know we're opening parks and making it more and more available and our staff is really stepping up and doing the great work. Oh, oh um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say some good news, which is that many, many, many other park agencies are reopening. And uh, that includes state parks, um, uh, Sonoma County, Marin County, um, San Mateo is even starting to open up swimming pools so we certainly can't guarantee this in any way, shape, or form, but there should be some relief with us being the only game in town. That's Eric's quote. And um, so we're hoping that uh, with the other parks uh, dramatically reopening, that more people will stay local over there and reduce some of our use. But we're going to have plenty of use, obviously. But we were having a lot of people from other areas come to the East Bay. There's no question about it. And so I'm really happy that people are following our lead and Santa Clara's lead and San Francisco's lead and getting their parks back open again. And that should be helpful. Yeah, and I think some people are experimenting with, with different things, other park districts. I know my next door neighbor and your um, GIS supervisor is going up to Siskiyou County Park up by uh, Shasta and he, they're able to camp. Yeah. So I think we can get some good ideas out of some of our folks uh, coming back from this weekend if they're experiencing these things. Yep. Yeah, and those six foot circles are really- Isn't that something? I, I just, yeah, I, I, I sent uh, Phil Ginsburg a uh, email and said, wow, that's gonna go viral everywhere. That That is such a photo, yeah. uh, amazing, amazing. I, I thought it was, you know, not to be too silly, but I actually thought it was like spring training and those were like, you know, baseball practice boxes or something. I, I couldn't figure out when I first saw the picture till I read the, the caption underneath. That's just amazing. <laughs> Big tic-tac-toe game. Okay, well then Thank let's you. move on to the articles and other media. You saw the me uh, uh, articles that were placed in our packet. Uh, anybody have any comments, questions on those? Well, um, I think... It's good to uh, see them electronically and not get them, have them appear in a paper packet. Good idea. Like a yeah. hundred and something pages. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I thank staff for compiling those. They're all very interesting. I find them great. One thing I did find out this time, and I notice that every time I seem to um, see articles and newspaper things and, and uh, TV things. It's amazing when they talk about parks and how parks are, are open and people get there. It's always our signs, always our graphics. Yeah. And uh, yeah. that's, a, that's a real compliment to the, um, the, the environmental graphics program because they seem to choose ours. And I'm, I'm really proud of that. And there is a, one in this, this issue here. It's a the, great observation and I'll make sure we pass that along to uh, to the staff because they are working very hard over there. And their supply chain has been a challenge too. Just even getting the materials to do the signs the first five weeks was really hard. Uh, but they, if you notice you've been out in the parks, they're well signed. They're really well signed. Oh yeah. Okay, so now we've come to the open public forum or the open forum for public comment. Pardon me, do we have any comments? Chair uh, Waspy, we have not received any public comments for this meeting. Okay, then we'll move to board comments. Do we have any board comments? 
Okay, hearing none, I, I would like to thank Yuli and all the staff. I think these Zoom meetings are getting so much better. I don't know that I'm getting any better conducting them, but uh, everything else is, seems to work a little bit better. Is that a question, Eric, or are you waving? I just, it, I, it sounded like you may be wrapping up and I just wanted to put out there, um, and I don't know exactly of the right date, but we were not scheduled to have a June legislative committee meeting um, at the beginning of the year. We were anticipating a budget surplus and not necessarily needing to meet right after the budget passed. Um, so I think given the situation we're in now, we may wanna re reconsider having a meeting in June. And I think the question would be, probably whether it would be the 19th, which is only four days after the budget or the 26th. Um, so I, I think we can figure that out offline. I just wanted to flag it while we were all here on the, on the phone together. Okay, that seems like a good idea to me. Do other board members have any comments? Yes, you know, I do. There is a um, group of women elected who have a, a regular lunch and it is, um, and they're doing it on Zoom. You know, you eat your sandwich and do, currently. Um, so I missed it today. And that would probably um, be the um, June 26th too. So I, I would like to just say, I would like to make it to a couple of those. And um, so I'd go for the earlier date. We'll coordinate that, Beverly. We'll make Thank sure you. that happens. Thank you. And besides, on the 26th, we have a board tour of Alameda and the East Shore. Or should I cross that off? <laughs> yeah, I, I, yes, you probably should. Uh, I think we just need to do like Google does and <clears throat> mount a camera on a park car and drive around and have virtual tours. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, anyway, um, thank you, oh, Ju Yuli. Thank you so much for your coordinating all this, and um, everybody have a safe and happy Memorial Day. Okay, thank you. We are adjourned. Thank, thank you. you.